Good morning, class. Uh, we're back and we're getting ready to start doing the second part of the, your um, Chapter 5 uh, slides. So please bear with me as I get everything set up here. Starting on slide 40, which is going to start covering the respiratory system. And let me just make sure that you guys are still seeing what I'm seeing. And let's do here. back one. So talking about the respiratory uh, system, the anatomy, you have the structures of the body that uh, contribute to the respiration, the process of your breathing. Breathing in and out, in and out. It's an old saying in EMS that goes like this. Air goes in and out, blood goes round and round. Any difference or change in that's a problem and we need to be aware of it. It's a nice picture of, the, of your Airway system, upper airway, lower airway, and over here, down in here, the little sacs here called your alveoli. We'll talk about more about them. So let's get busy here. Upper airway is going to consist of the nose, the mouth, the tongue, the jaw, and the oral cavity. It's also going to consist of the uh, pharynx, the nasal pharynx, the oral pharynx, and the uh, laryngeal pharynx. Lar larynx is, an, uh, is anterior, and the esophagus is posterior. So you have your nasopharynx, you have your, your larynx is right here, it's going to go into your, to your trachea, and your esophagus is back here. Upper airway also is going to be your epiglottis, prevents food and liquid uh, from entering the, the trachea. Your larynx is, uh, is the dividing line between the upper and the lower, lower airways. It's going to be Think about things like the Adam's apple. We all have one. Guys and girls both have your Adam's apple, but it's more prominent on males than it is on female. Adam's apple is that thyroid cartilage. Is it anterior? Is that place in the on your throat right here? Um, if you fill your throat, you fill that little box there. If you also feel, you feel the the, the cricoid or the cricoid cartilage, the rings that that form the lower part of the larynx. The trachea is your windpipe. It ends at the carina which is the dividing into the right and left uh, bronchial, leading to the bronchioles, which are in your lungs. There are two lungs uh, are held in place uh, by the trachea, your arteries and your veins and your pulmonary ligaments. It's divided into two lobes, the, bronchial, uh, the bronchi and the bronchioles in with the alveoli. Your, alve your alveoli allow for gas exchange. We'll talk more about this when we get into external and internal respiration. Your lungs are covered by a smooth, glistening tissue called the pleura. Anybody had pleurisy? Anybody's parents ever had pleurisy? Pleurisy is this inflammation of the pleura, which some people get in the winter months and sometimes in the summer months, and they can cough and it hurts to breathe. There's a nice picture there. That is a picture of your trachea. And as you see here, this is the little uh, ridges and rings that if you fill in your throat, you can actually fill them there. And you have your thyroid cartilage and your cricoid, uh, and your cricoid cartilage. And we'll talk more about those as we get down to them. What is, your, what is the primary muscle in breathing? It's the diaphragm. Also involved are your intercostal muscles, your abdominal muscles, and your pectoral muscles. But your major uh, uh, muscle for breathing is the diaphragm. The diaphragm is the primary muscle of breathing. I keep repeating this because you will probably see this on some sort of test either now, in the future, in a quiz or a test, or anytime that you see anything in the medical field, talking about muscles and breathing is going to be dealing with the diaphragm most test times. There's a nice picture, if you can see it there. You have to watch it. This is breathing in and out. This is the diaphragm. Breathe in, diaphragm goes up. All right. Breathe in, diaphragm goes up. Breathe out, diaphragm goes down. So just watch. I 
I like that. I, I like that. Oops. Sorry about that. The uh, physiology of the respiratory system is the function is uh, to provide body with oxygen and eliminate carbon dioxide. Ventilation and respiration are two separate independent functions of the respiratory system. Respiration is what most of us talk about breathing in and breathing out, is actually the exchange of the oxygen and carbon dioxide on the alveoli and tissue level. Ventilation is getting air in and out. So when we breathe in and out, that's ventilation. Respiration is what's going on actually in our lungs and at the cellular level when the carbon dioxide and the oxygen exchange happen. Brainstem control is breathing. Hypoxic drive is backup system. Here again is the picture of the breathing. Now see that? Do it one more time there. Brain stem fires, tells you to breathe, you breathe in. Let's go to four. Sometimes we have technical difficulties. Let's see what we can do here. Alrighty. You provide ventilation when you administer oxygen. Or also when you use a bag valve mask. You guys have all heard of a bag valve mask by now, I hope. And breathing in somebody is the actual the act of ventilating and the act of actually getting the person to breathe in and out. Air in and out is ventilation. Respiration is the exchange of gases at the alveoli and the tissue level between the carbon dioxide and the oxygen. Tidal volume is the amount of air that is moved into and out of the lungs in a single breath. So let's talk about some characteristics of normal breathing. Your normal rate and depth is going to be the tidal volume, regular rhythm or pattern of, of inhalation and exhalation. You want to have good audible breath sounds on both sides of the chest. If you listen very carefully, you might be able to hear my uh, dog Juju snoring. Don't know if you can or not. She's sitting behind me. But you want to hear good audible breath sounds as you're listening to somebody with a stethoscope. You want to hear them breathe in. Breathe out. You want to hear good breath sounds. You want to make sure that they have a regular rise and fall movement on both sides of their chest. And you want to make sure the, uh, that there's movement slightly of the abdomen. For some people you see it, some people you don't. I have a little bit bigger belly than most people, so when you see me breathe, you're going to see it jiggle a little bit. Hopefully it don't, doesn't go there for long, but it does do some time. But you want to see regular rise and fall of the chest and slight movement of the uh, abdomen. So we talk about good breath sounds. What about bad or inadequate breath patterns in adults? Labored breathing. That's not a good thing. Or ha, having trouble breathing. Muscle re uh, retractions. Pale, cyanotic, cool, damp skin. Pale is going to be pale. Whitish color. Abnormally colored. Cyanotic is blue. So it's not good to be a Smurf or be the member of the Blue Man Group unless you're a Smurf in a Blue Man Group. If you're not, you should be whatever color you are. Black, white, brown, tan, green, red, but you should not be pale, gray, or blue. So they call the tripod position. If you would, please push your seat back right now. Stand up, I mean not stand up, but sit up as straight as you can. Put your both of your hands on your knees and lean forward on your arms. If you come in a room and you see a patient, who is sitting that same manner, that's called the tripod position. Here again, sitting with their hands on their knees to be able to push up to get more air and more room to their lungs. Agonal gasp. This is gasping for breath. Think about when you run really, really, really hard and you're gasping for breath. 
That's a good thing is you're getting your breath. This is used about somebody who's breathing about four times a minute and they're gasping for breath only at four times. Normal respiration should be between 8 and 12 a minute. Or we say 12 to 20 a minute was the normal rate that we'll talk about here in a second. The circulatory system <coughs> is anatomy and physiology. <coughs> Excuse me, it's anatomy. Complex arrangement of connecting tubes, arteries, arterioles, capillaries, venules, and veins. There's two circuits, the symptomatic circulation, which is to the body, and the pulmonary circulation, which is in the lungs. Nice picture there. You get a whole lot more uh, talking about that from time to time. So the blood comes in from the upper body and the lower body, and it goes to the lungs, where it's uh, offloading carbon dioxide, unloading oxygen, and it's then sent to the uh, left atrium to the left uh, ventricle, then out to the body, and it goes back around. The heart is a hollow muscular organ the size of, of an adult's clenched fist. They say if you clench your fist and put it to your chest, it's the same size of what your heart should be. This is made of specialized cardiac muscle called the myocardium. It actually works as two pairs of pumps. One pump, but two parts. So more or less two different pumps themselves. The septum divides the right and the left sides. So you have the right heart and the left heart, but one heart. Each side is divided into the atrium, the upper chamber, so the ventricles, the lower chambers. Circulation. Heart receives blood from the aorta. Right side receives blood from the veins. Left side receives blood from the lungs. Right side, left side. That's the, the circulation, how it does, and how blood goes in. Blood goes out. The blue side is unoxygenated. The red side is the oxygenated. So blood is coming in from the uh, inferior and superior vena cavus that's unoxygenated, goes to the lungs, it gets oxygen, then it's returned back to the heart, where it's pumped to the body, and that's why you see it as being red. Arteries carry oxygenated blood. Veins carry unoxygenated blood. The normal resting heart rate for an adult is 60 to 100 beats per minute. Stroke volume, the amount of blood moved by one beat, and cardiac output is the amount of blood moved in one minute. So you have, to get your cardiac output, you have to, this is where we get math going, heart rate times your stroke volume gives you cardiac output. In one minute, body's entire blood volume, five to six liters, is circulated through all the vessels. That's amazing. Every minute, all the blood that's in your body right now is circulated through the, all your vessels back to your heart. Then you have electrical con conduction network inside your heart also. It causes smooth, coordinated contractions. Contractions produce the pumping action that pumps the blood throughout the heart into the body. Arteries. Arteries carry blood from the heart to all the body tissues. Branches into your arterioles. Your arterioles branch into capillaries. Pulse is created by blood pumping out of the left ventricle into the major arteries. If you would, so you can get your pulse, take two or three fingers of one hand and put it on the outside of the other hand's thumb. Now run that down over the th uh, next to the thumb, down the little pad there until you get to the radial pulse. As you push, come down the thumb, down that little pad there to where you get your third finger in the corner of the pad and you should be able to fill a pulse. Can everybody fill a pulse? I can. Your major arteries are your, are, uh, are your aorta and your heart, your pulmonary, which is your right, there they're next to your right ventricle, the carotids in your neck, the femorals in your thigh or your, low, or your upper leg. The posterior tibia is your lower leg and the dorsal pedis is found on the foot. It's places you can find pulses. Your brachial, is your, upper, your brachial is your upper arm, and your radial is your lower arm. Nice picture there. Capillaries connect arterioles to the venules. Fine end uh, divisions from artery system allow contact between the blood and the cells. Billions of capillaries are in everybody's bodies. Billions, not millions, billions of capillaries are found in your body. When you cut your hand, you cut your hand and you start a little bit of oozing, Blood, 
dark colored blood, that's cutting a capillary bed. That's billions of those little areas that have blood. And the blood goes there, and then it's it's exchange it's you have gas exchange there. Veins return oxygenated, oxygen depleted blood to the heart. Superior vena cava carries blood returning from the head, neck, and shoulders to the upper extremities. Inferior vena cava carries blood from the, uh, the abdomen, the pelvis, and lower extremities. They all join at the right atrium. Your spleen, a solid organ located under the rib cage, filters blood. It's, uh, it's particularly susceptible to injury from blunt trauma, like car wrecks, baseball bats, fists. What about a football helmet from a football player hitting somebody in the abdomen? This can all lead to severe internal bleeding. So what makes up your blood? Plasma, red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. Some more about the circulatory systems and its physiology. Blood pressure is the pressure blood exerts against the walls of arteries. When your left, atri when your left ventricle of the heart contracts, it pumps blood from the ventricles into the aorta. This is called systole. When, you're, when the muscle of the ventricle uh, relax, the ventricle fills with blood, called diastole. Your blood pressure readings, systolic blood pressure is at the high point of the wave, which is your upper number, and your diastolic blood pressure is the low number or your bottom number. I always have to have little things to help me remind things or remember things. So your diastolic number is always the bottom number because D means down. So your top number, your top reading that you get when you're taking blood pressures, you guys have been doing blood pressures there with Chief uh, Barber, is your top number is, is your systolic, and your diastolic is your lower number. Normal circulation in adults, they're automatically adjust, con uh, adjusted and controlled. Perfusion is circulation of blood in organ and tissue. Perfusion is circulation of blood in organ or tissue in, in adequate amounts to meet the, ne the needs of the cell. Perfusion is your body, the tissues and the organs are getting adequate amounts of oxygen and the food it needs. That's called perfusion. But what do you think it's called when you're not getting perfusion? When you're not getting the perfusion you need? Then your body is in, anybody ever heard of shock? Shock. Shock. There's a working definition for shock and it's called inadequate tissue perfusion. So if perfusion is circulation of the blood in organs and the tissues in adequate amounts to meet the uh, needs of the cells. Shock is inadequate tissue perfusion. Blood enters the organs and the tissues through arteries. Blood leaves the organs and the tissues through veins. It comes down the artery, to the arterioles, to the capillary bed. And at this point here, you have the gas exchange, your offloading oxygen, and your unloading carbon dioxide. And then you have your capillaries, your venules, and your veins going back to the heart to start again. It comes down the arteries, comes through, back around. It's a never-ending cycle. Here again, air goes in and out, blood goes round and round. Any change in that is a problem. When we have inadequate circulation in adults, the system can adjust to small blood losses, but not really well to large. Your vessels constrict, your heart pumps more readily, with a large loss, adjustment fails and the patient goes into shock, inadequate tissue perfusion. There you have a couple of functions of the blood. We're talking a lot about the blood here. Blood fights infections. It transports oxygen. It transports carbon dioxide. It controls pH. How do, how do you think about what pH is? Acid and base, right? So your blood has a lot to do with your, your if you are acidotic or if you're an alkalotic in your blood, in your, what's going on in your blood. Transporting waste and, nu and nutrients, clotting, which is also known as coagulation. Your nervous system controls the cardiovascular system. Your sympathetic nervous system is responsible for your fight or flight response. Since commands to your adrenal glands, the epi and norepi are secreted and stimulate the heart and blood vessels. The best way for me to explain this to you is if I was in the room there with you right now, I'd be walking behind somebody being very, very quiet very, very quiet. I get behind somebody and go, ah! Scare them. And what do you think is going to happen? Their hands might go back. Their hands might clench. They might want to pump me, uh, punch me in the eye, punch me in the belly. But their fight or flight, they want to get out of there. 
I scared the mess out of them. Anybody ever been scared the mess out of you? Well, I have. My kids love scaring me, and I love scaring them. Blood vessels have an alpha uh, adrenaline receptors. Your hearts and lungs have beta adrenaline receptors. Your parasympathetic nervous system also has effects on the cardiovascular system. And this addresses the actions that do not require immediate responses. Believe it or not, you will get this eventually before this course is over. There's a lot of information here, but you're going to get it. Believe me. Hang with me. We're going to get this stuff. The nervous system is perhaps the most complex organ in the body. It consists of the brain and the spinal cord. It's divided into two more uh, major portions, the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. Central is the main part of the body. Peripheral is your arms and legs and anything else you can think of. It's a nice thing. You can see this on the slides there if you'd like. Some more about the central nervous system. Brain uh, controlling organ of the body. So divide into your cerebellum, your cerebrum, and the brain stem. Cerebrum, cerebellum, and the brain stem. Have the spinal cord. It's a... Um, it's a continuation of the brain, transmits messages between the brain and the body. It's a nice picture there. That's your peripheral nervous system. You ever kick a doctor or a nurse when, they, when they're checking your reflexes? your deep tendon reflex goes to your brain brain sends it back and says kick your leg out the peripheral nervous system is divided into two main portions your um, somatic nervous system and your automatic nervous system we're almost done here for a second guys Your somatic ner nervous system transmits signals from the brain to the voluntary muscle, allowing you to walk and talk. That's a good thing, especially uh, in high school and in college. The automatic nervous system is involuntary action like digestion and dilation. This, the automatic also is split into two, the sympathetic nervous system, your fight or flight, or your parasympathetic nervous system, which slows your body. It is also known as your feed and breed. Feed and breed. Fight or flight is your sympathetic, and your parasympathetic is your feed and breed. There are two types of nervous uh, nerves within the peripheral nervous system. Sensory nerves carry information from your body to your central nervous system. And motory nerves carry information from your CNS to your muscles to get you to do something. We're going to stop right here for right now, and we'll talk about the, uh, the inter your skin system tomorrow, uh, or later today if you want to watch it. And I just want to say you guys have a good afternoon, and thank you for listening, and I hope you guys have a good afternoon or a good morning, and I will check back with you later. Have a great day.